Okay, so we now come to a, a very uh, pleasant part of today's proceedings. The uh, Clay Mathematics Institute has uh, made two research awards this year. Uh, one to Mariam Mersakani of Stanford University. She, unfortunately, has not been able to travel to Oxford today, so that presentation uh, will be made at a later date. Uh, but now uh, uh, we are going to make the presentation to Peter Schultzer uh, for uh, his, uh, in recognition of his many and significant contributions to arithmetic algebraic geometry, uh, particularly uh, to the in the development and applications of the theory of perfectoid spaces. Um, but before we make that formal presentation, I'm going to call on uh, Michael Rappaport of the University of Bonn to tell us something about uh, Peter's work. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Dear Mrs. and Mr. Clay, <coughs> dear governing bodies of the Clay Foundation, dear Peter, Miss Susanna and Frank and Miriam, dear students and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to speak here about Peter Schulze. I see my task as threefold. First, to explain why Peter Schulze is an excellent choice for the Clay Research Award 2014. Second, to present Peter Schulze as a person and as a mathematician. And third, to convey some of the excitement that Schulze's ideas have aroused in our field. It is clear that I cannot give here a technical account of Schulze's results in the brief time allotted to me. I will instead give you a few samples of results that are consequences of his ideas that can be appreciated even by a non-specialist although unfortunately perhaps not by a non-mathematician. <coughs> I start with a short CV. Short also because Schulze is very young, more precisely only 26 years old. Peter was born in 1987 in Dresden, but grew up in Berlin. He finished high school in 2007 by getting the Abitur at the Heinrich Herz Gymnasium. I mention the name of this high school because it has a special significance since it has a long tradition of producing professional mathematicians. During the years 2002 to 2007, namely when he was between 14 and 19 years old, Peter engaged in intensive independent study in mathematics, in later years of which he was tutored by Klaus Altmann, professor at the Freie Universität Berlin, who is also a former student of the Heinrich Herz Gymnasium. During the years 2004 to 2007, Peter was an active participant of the International Mathematical Olympiad, at which he won three gold medals and one silver medal. During all this time, Peter developed a keen interest in arithmetic algebraic geometry, which is still at the center of his mathematical focus although he didn't neglect other mathematical disciplines. In 2007, he enrolled as a student at the University of Bonn under my tutelage. This choice of advisor was not only due to my mathematical orientation, but was also the result of an old boys connection, since I too had been a student at the same high school 40 years prior to Peter, and had in fact been Altmann's tutor some 30 years earlier. Peter got his bachelor's degree in 2008 and his master's degree in 2010. In 2012, he obtained his PhD and was made the same year a host of professor at the University of Bonn. He's married and is the father of a girl that has just had her first birthday. Here now is a list of honors that Scholze received before the Clay Research Award today. The Clay Fellowship in 2011, the Hausdorff Prize from bon the University of Bonn in 2012. He was the invited speaker at the current development in mathematics series in 2012 at Harvard University. He received the Prix Peco in 2013 from the Collège de France. He received the Sastra and Ramanujan Prize in 2013. He gave the Ramanujan lectures at the Tata Institute in Bombay, 
this year. The Marston Morse lectures at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton. He was an invited section lecturer at the International Congress and he holds at the moment the Chancellor's Professorship at the University of California in Berkeley. Next, let me mention some of the most significant results of Scholze to date. So here's a slide in which I have listed the main results that he has obtained so far and I would like to comment them in the sequel uh, and as I say may, maybe give some samples of results that uh, can be appreciated also by a non-specialist. So the first point on the slide is a new proof of the local Langlands correspondence. Here Scholz's main invention was the determination of the semi-simple sheaf of nearby cycles in certain geometric situations. The hypotheses for Scholz's formula are satisfied in the case of Shimura varieties studied by Cutbirds, Harris and Taylor, and which are used as the basic geometric input of the proof of Harris and Taylor and Enyar of the local Langlands correspondence for the general linear group of a local field of characteristic zero. Based on this geometric theorem, Schulze gave a completely different proof of the local Langlands correspondence that doesn't use the cumbersome reduction to characteristic P and avoids complicated ad hoc methods that lie behind the numerical Langlands correspondence of NR. So the next slide, if I manage to get there, not quite. Not quite. Maybe I roll it down like this. Okay. Uh, the next uh, slide explains <coughs> explains the uh, principle of uh, Scholz's proof. So you start with an element of the Weyer group. So this is a generalization of the Galois group, and for Purpose, for technical purposes, you also fix a function with compact support on the uh, integral <coughs> elements of your group that have take values in the field of rational numbers. And now you define a function on the group with values in the unramified extension of degree r by this formula. Now I don't explain this formula, but the main point is that on the right hand side you have the trace of this, this element of the Weyer group times this function on a certain sheaf of nearby cycles on a geometric object, namely a deformation space of p-divisible groups. So it doesn't matter that if you don't understand these terms, the main thing is that this is a geometric quantity. And the theorem of Scholz says the following. So first of all, this function uh, 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 always has, takes rational values and is independent of L. And the second thing is the important thing, namely if you take any functions on the group downstairs, so over QP itself, that matches phi in the sense of the Langlands correspondence, then for any irreducible smooth representation of the group, there exists a unique n-dimensional representation of the Weyer group which we call the image under the reciprocity map, such that you have this very simple relation between the trace of the function on the representation and the trace of this element in the Weyer group on this Galois representation. So in other words, this is a means of associating to a representation on the automorphic side, I mean more precisely on a, a smooth representation on the GLN side, a Galois representation. Now this is exactly the contents of the uh, Langlands correspondence, except that Langlands prescribed this correspondence in completely different terms, namely as an equality between L functions and epsilon factors. But Scholze also proves that in fact, at least if pi is supercuspider, then indeed this is exactly the representation that is prescribed by the classical Langlands correspondence. So I mean there's this hypothesis that the supercuspidal, that once you know this for supercuspidals, we know how to extend this to all representations. This is a technical uh, procedure that is well understood for, the, for a long time. 
Okay, the second point on my list was the theory of perfectoid spaces. This is a general method to reduce problems of algebraic geometry over fields of mixed characteristic, like the field of periodic numbers, to fields of positive characteristic, which are often easier to solve, mainly due to the power of, Frobenius, of the Frobenius map in characteristic P. This method is nothing short of a revolution in algebraic geometry, and there have been seminars all over the world to study this method. I myself know of seminars in Bonn, Münster, Paris, Princeton, Beijing, Toronto and Columbia, but there were doubtless many more. I don't want to explain this method, but rather invite you to watch Schultz's excellent exposition at the ICM. It's on video and I will refrain from further remarks on this topic. The next point on my list was the proof of the weight monodromic conjecture in many cases. As a first application of perfectoid spaces, Schultz approved the weight monodromic conjecture for smooth, complete intersections in projective space. The conjecture explains through the monodromic operator the lack of Frobenius purity in the cohomology of smooth projective varieties over fields of mixed characteristic but which have bad reduction modulo p. This conjecture, which is due to De Linea in 1970, is the major open problem in the etal cohomology of algebraic varieties, and Schultz's theorem is the first significant advance in over 30 years. The next point on the list was called Piatic Hodge theory for rigid analytic spaces. This is a second application of perfectoid spaces and generalizes and streamlines the Piatic Hodge theory for schemes, which is due to Fontaine, Messing, Faltings, Cato, and Tsuji. Tate asked more than 40 years ago whether such a theory exists. The next slide, if I ever move there, uh, gives a confirmation to one conjecture of Tate. Okay, so the theorem states the following. You, you take an algebraically closed, complete periodic field and a proper, smooth, rigid analytic space over C. So this is the analog on the periodic world of a complex analytic variety. And you form the cohomology groups that we are used to in the complex world, namely, first of all, the cohomology groups of x with values in the sheaves of differentials, then the Durham cohomology groups, and the etal cohomology groups, which are the replacement of the singular cohomology groups. <coughs> the theorem states that there is an equality between these numbers, namely the etal cohomology and Durham cohomology have the same dimension, as well as if you take the sum of the uh, um, Hodge cohomology groups for i plus j given, equal to the given degree. So this is the periodic analog of a well-known theorem over the complex numbers, which goes back to Poincaré, Hodge, and Durham, and which states that in the case of a compact Kähler variety, we have exactly the same result, <coughs> where except for etal cohomology, we look at singular cohomology. It's very interesting to, s to remark here that the scalar, it's well known that over the complex numbers, this theorem becomes false without the Kähler condition, whereas in Scholz's theorem, there's no such condition. Otherwise said, in the periodic domains, there are no non kähler varieties. Um, the next point on my list was the moduli of p-divisible group. This is a third application of perfectoid spaces. Scholze and Jared Weinstein develop a theory of universal coverings of p-divisible groups with a number of striking applications. The next slide gives you a sample of this theory. Okay, so the theorem says that there is an equivalence of categories between the category of p-divisible groups 
over the integers of this field C that was on the last slide, and pairs consisting of a finite free ZP module and a subvector space of the vector C vector space that you obtain by extending scalars uh, to C. And this is obviously the periodic analog of a well known theorem of the 19th century, which is due to Riemann, who proved that there's an equivalence of categories between the category of complex tori and the category of pairs of consisting of a finite free Z module, so instead of a ZL module, you have a Z module, and a subvector space <coughs> of the complex vector space that you obtain by extension of scalars. And then there's an additional condition over the complex numbers that doesn't make sense over periodic numbers, but fortunately it is not used in this theorem. I mean, Riemann also has this additional thing, which is in some sense even deeper, that the complex torus is in the Bering variety if and only if this pair is polarizable. There is no analog of such a thing in the periodic domain. The next point on my list was torsion in the cohomology of symmetric spaces. Scholz shows that one can associate a Galois representation to any system of eigenvalues appearing in the p-power torsion cohomology of GLN over a totally real OCM field with matching Frobenius eigenvalues. The next slide gives you one application of this. Namely, you start with the Shimura variety uh, uh, corresponding to a level where, uh, which you subdivide into a level at p and a level prime to p. And now you take uh, its cohomology and you let the, um, you let the, um, the, the uh, uh, compact the subgroup at p shrink to, to zero, to, to, to the identity group, so you get bigger and bigger groups. And the theorem states that by doing this, you get a vanishing theorem, namely as soon as, as, soon as the, in the degree of the cohomology is bigger than the dimension, you get, when you look at this as torsion coefficients, you get zero. This is somewhat reminiscent of a classical theorem, which dates from the 80s, uh, which is due to Borel, Kassemann, Garland, Prasad, Wallach and Zuckerman, which uh, states in the case that the Shimura variety is compact, that if you look at the cohomology for a degree higher than two times the dimension minus the R rank, you get something that is well, not zero, but it's banal in the sense that this is all generated by obvious uh, cohomology classes that you see by looking at the compact dual of the Shimura variety. But this theorem is really quite different from Scholz's theorem because, first of all, the degree in this theorem of uh, Borel and so on is much larger than uh, the dimension <coughs> of the Shimura variety because the rank is in general uh, uh, smaller than the dimension. But on the other hand, there's also a basic difference, namely that they don't pass to the, uh, to the limit in, in P, but they state this for any. And finally, of course, there's a big difference that they state this only for uh, uh, cohomology with coefficients in Q and not for torsion coefficients. This, by the way, proves the conjecture of Caligari and Hamilton. The next point on my list was the geometric construction of periodic Langlands correspondences. I will leave out this point because it's maybe too technical and pass on to the last point, the pro etal side. Because I think this is typical of Scholz's approach to mathematics. Grotendieck had explained 50 years ago that the etal cohomology of non-torsion chiefs is essentially trivial and that in order to obtain interest in cohomology groups in characteristic zero, one had to first take the cohomology of torsion sheaths and then pass to the limit. Here Grotendieck was following André Weil, who in the 40s of the last century 
treated the case of abelian varieties through their Tate modules, which arise by considering the L to the N torsion points of abelian varieties and passing to the limit. Scholze introduces a new topology on the category of sheaves, of schemes, which has the virtues, virtue that sheaves like ZL and QL behave in just the way that we expect from classical topology. And in joint work with Bargav Bat also introduces a fundamental group of schemes, which is reasonable even for highly singular schemes. So this is my next slide. So let me start with the definition. A topological group is called a Nohi group if G is complete and admits a basis of open neighborhoods of the identity element given by open subgroups. So examples are locally profinite groups, like for instance GLN, QL, or discrete groups. And the theorem is that one can associate so one starts with a connected scheme whose underlying topological space is locally Noetherian, so that's not a really restriction. And then for any geometric point of X, we can associate a Nohi group such that local systems and QL vector spaces on X are equivalent to continuous representations of this group in finite dimensional QL vector spaces. This is obviously the scheme theoretic analog of the following well-known theorem in topology, namely that X be a path-connected Hausdorff topological space, which is semi-locally simply connected, then for any group point X, there's a discrete group pi 1 of X, which we call the fundamental group, such that local systems and Q vector spaces on X are equivalent to representations of this fundamental group and finite dimensional Q vector spaces. Now let me say a few words about Scholze as a member of our mathematics community. <coughs> he is very communicative and generous with his ideas, and even though you hear him often laughing in the hallway, he may well be in the middle of an explanation of difficult material. As a colleague, he is enormously valuable. He participates actively in the mathematical life in Bonn and elsewhere. He gives courses and seminars, in which he presents results in the literature or in which he explains his newest discoveries. For instance, he has led our Argos seminar in Bonn to work through some of his papers before they were actually finished. At a number of occasions, the speaker got his script from the composer only the night before his performance with all the anxiety that this can create. At the moment, he's presenting his new theory of diamonds in his course in Berkeley, and the room is packed with students and vetted mathematicians alike. The speed with which he reacts to any questions from the audience is amazing. In fact, it turns out that he has thought of most of these questions himself. But he is also a vigilant listener of talks of others and is capable of clarifying the situation in the wink of an eye and to give constructive suggestions. At the Hot Topics workshop on perfected spaces at the MSRI earlier this year, it was elating to see him lead a huge group of students and professors through the intricacies of his theory. Just imagine what it was like for me to give six graduate courses in a row with this guy and the audience. <laughs> By the way, during this time, I tried to get him to take notes at lectures with no success. Fortunately, he seems to manage reasonably well without them. <laughs> what is remarkable about Schultz's approach to mathematics is the ultimate simplicity of his ideas. Even though the execution of these ideas demands technical power, of which Schultz has an extraordinary command, it is still true that the initial key idea and the final result have the appeal of inevitability of the classics as well as their elegance. I hope my samples of his results have given you a feel for this. I am sure that we can expect more great things from Scholze in the future, and it will be interesting to see to what further heights Scholze's work will take him. 
I want to conclude with two observations. First, I find it remarkable with which speed Scholz's ideas, as well as Scholz as a mathematician, were accepted in the mathematical world. Only five years ago, he was an unknown master student back in Bonn. Now he is one of the most sought for and admired mathematicians in the world. This is the stuff for romantic stories which is surely part of the appeal of mathematics throughout the ages. But it also shows the fundamental health of our subject and that we welcome newcomers with new and revolutionary ideas. Second, since this is Britain, I want to end with a whimsical remark of a personal nature. As I mentioned in the beginning, both Scholze and I come from Berlin. Now, one of the most important families in Berlin and one of the richest in the 19th century was the Mendelssohn family. This family became prominent through Moses Mendelssohn, the famous philosopher at the end of the 18th century, who also happened to be a very successful businessman. The name of the family became known worldwide through Moses Mendelssohn's grandson, Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi. What I want to relate to you is a remark of Felix's father, Abraham, a banker who further increased the wealth of the family. Namely, he is supposed to have said that the first half of my life I was known as the son of my father, whereas the second half I was known as the father of my son. <laughs> Paraphrasing this remark, I might say that the first half of my life as a mathematician, I was known as the student of Delinie, whereas the second half, I am known as the teacher of Scholze. <laughs> but whimsical remarks do not always reflect reality. Maybe they are too static. The roles of teacher and student have in many ways been reversed between Peter and me in these past years, and in fact, I want to use this occasion to thank you, Peter, for all the things you have taught me and continue to teach me. And now I ask you all to join me in congratulating Peter for his research.